and welcome to the Chaw Valley History Show on Friday the 26th of June. Well, today it's a very special programme because it's our living history one. We're focusing on all matters, living history, experimental archaeology. We're talking to Luke Winter. We're doing Iron Age. We're doing World War II engineering. And once again, we're plunging the archives and you can follow us on social media here. Okay, so today we're looking at medieval war bows, and I've got here a yew war bow, which is an exact replica of one found on the Mary Rose, which sank in 1545. It's made of English yew, and I made this uh, a couple of months ago, so it's a brand new bow, which I've not shot yet. And the draw weight of this bow is about 140 pounds. To put that into perspective, uh, your average Olympic recurve bow is about 45 pounds. So we're talking about a very heavy military weight bow here to send heavy arrows a long way. The ends of the bow have got cow horn tips on them, which are glued in place with a fish glue. And the string is linen, with linen binding where the arrow goes. This kind of bow weight is about average for what they would have been shooting back then. They went up to around 190, 200 pounds. We know that now from the Mary Rose wreck. Uh, and to kind of get that kind of weight under control, you want to be learning from a very young age, probably around seven or eight, shooting every week, at least once a week, until you're in control of each weight and then you move up through the weights as you, as you get stronger. So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot this bow with an arrow that I've made, again, based on the Mary Rose. This is an ash arrow with swan feathers and verdigris compound. And the verdigris compound is a, it's a beautiful green colour, but also it's an insecticide. So when you're kind of keeping the arrows in storage, moths and insects won't eat the feathers and the bindings and it keeps them away. We've got a nice piece of cow horn in the knock end to reinforce the arrow. The feathers are bound on with silk and the head is a London Museum Type 7 needle bodkin which is ideal for shooting through mail. So, 140 pound bow, let's see how far it goes. It's all right. So I'm presenting Iron Age paints and pigments, so colours that would have been available, uh, mineral pigments, uh, in the Iron Age, so usually in Britain around 800 BC to 43 AD. For paints, I use mineral paints, earth pigments, and that's the big difference between dyes and paints. That's a question I usually get. Um, basically, paints are anything made out of minerals, so unliving things, when dyes, to colour your clothes really, are made from living materials, so plants, roots, etc. Um, so for example, all these are colours that were available in Britain in the Iron Age, and as I usually portray a colour merchant from Gaul, I can bring in different colours that are earth or rocks that I can gather all around the place. Um, but there's very local ones. I mean, the usual ones are yellow, red and purple ochres, and these are available in Gloucestershire in the Forest of Dean. It's quite lucky, actually, because the purple is quite rare. So that would be these ones. Um, as I come from Herefordshire, well, I lived in Herefordshire, that's the pigment I will show you how to process today. You start by picking up uh, clays, rocks, earth, stones, even precious stones, but anything mineral that you can grind that has a colour. So around here, chalk, a lot. <laughs> but in Herefordshire there's so much iron in the ground that we end up with that type of colour, so a very terracotta type of clay in the fields. If you pick some up and dry it off, you will need a pestle and mortar or a stone and a pebble to really grind them to a fine powder. Once you have that fine powder, I usually use the levigation method, which is using water, so that's quite practical. And you might see, especially on a white background, you have a very light water at the top, but all the grit and sand will fall at the bottom and the fine layer of pigment will be at the top. I want the grit and the sand to remain at the bottom for discarding, to discard it really. Oopsie. So you will have a light swirl of colored water that I just agitate a little bit for you to see. There you go. So all these light colored particles are the pigments you want to make paints. So I'll pour that colored water in a dish leave it in the sun or near a fire to dry off and I will end up with pure pigment really that I need to then grind and mix with any kind of medium to turn into a paint. 
Now that has to be powdered again and you get a very fine pure pigment. That's it. So wherever you live, you can just gather some colored earth, maybe in your garden or on a walk, maybe not in everybody's field, uh, powder it and you can make uh, more or less light pigment depending on the type of art or surface you want to paint on. I usually paint on walls, but it's a bit complicated to move a whole roundhouse around here. So I decided to paint on a, on a board of oak. And it's a design I started um, way, way earlier. Um, and I'm using tempera paint with red ochre. So the red ochre is just powdered pigment and minerals turned into a powder. And tempera paint, very much liked by the Romans as well, is egg yolk with a bit of water and the pigments mixed in. It's just that. Um, so I made some here and for the rest I only did a paintbrush. <laughs> so I can make one. Um, I have a selection of them already made and I'm using usually feathers, animal hair, you can even use twigs, uh, chewed twigs, that's a very easy one to make. Don't chew anything you don't know about. Uh, but my favorite is definitely the duck, um, duck feathers because they have some of them have a very pointy end, so you don't need to do anything with them apart from turning them into a little paintbrush. Once you have all these, genuinely, that's what I leave to the artists. <laughs> so I can paint a little bit, um, but mainly it's making the pigments and the paintbrushes the tool of the, of the trade that I'm interested in. I've always been very interested in the First World War. A lot of my descendants fought in it. And uh, I think it's quite important to keep that alive, keep that in the, in the memory of today's youth particularly. And I got into it personally by doing charity marches in First World War uniform, often in France at the front. And I've just slipped further down that reenactment road since. I always read up on what we're doing. I mean, we took the, the subject here that we're, we're talking about Operation Michael, in, which is March 1918, when the Germans fling this huge attack in. So on coming up to this, you sit down, we read the books, we get some of the stories of the men who were actually there. Same when it was the Somme. Um, we, we basically, and, and the kit you wear, you make sure it's absolutely right and you feel comfortable wearing it. And then you can carry that character off for not just the children, but for the adults as well. You get them into believing you, who you are. And again, I'm sort of being a teacher, a father, and all the other things I've done, you know, I can fix them with a stare. Well, to be, to be fair, my, my character is kind of me. Uh, just, you, you've got to be loud, you've got to make sure that the kids are not going to be noisy when they go in, so you've got to be in their face a bit. Um, that's it really. Um, back to preparation. Yeah, I mean, when you wear all this kit, you're in this sort of heat, you've got the thick woolen serge, you've got your putties on, the rifle, the kit, the preparation, uh, it's there naturally, you know, the weight. I mean, this is really bringing it to life, uh, we hope, in, in many ways. Um, so, preparation, it's, uh, it's given when you, when, you get into, when you get into all this gear, I think. After three, I want a rousing cry of God save the king. Don't be coy, demure, embarrassed. Let's be proud. After three. One, two, three. God save the king. Perm, I like that arm in the air. The victory. <laughs> well done. You know what? Take care. We'll see you soon. Cheerio, chums. Off you go. Be lucky. You're welcome. Um, Luke, I think it's fair to say that reenactors and living history have a little bit of a mixed press. I mean, you know, to a lot of people, it's just people dressing up in odd clothing and sort of prancing around pretending to be something that they're not. I, th I think that's certainly been the case in, in some people's opinions for, for many years, actually. Um, 
it, it's it's based on some sort of uh, fact, I suppose. Originally, is that is that lots of people got interested in living history um, because of the way it looks and the kind of the cool weapons you could wear and the, the kind of uh, things that you could do. Um, but I think what we've been trying to do at, at the History Festival for the last few years is really move it onto a, a sort of different place. Yeah, and, and try and bring some sort of rigour to it. And, and living history, I mean, I, I've witnessed this, and you completely opened my eyes to this, with all the amazing work you've done, both at the Ancient Technology Centre at Cranbourne and elsewhere, to kind of actually how much one can really learn about the past in a way that you simply can't by just sitting at a desk and looking at books. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, what I am as, as a sort of trained archaeologist is, is an experimental archaeologist. So, so I think we should probably talk about that um, in, a, in, a, in a small way. Um, so experimental archaeology is, is a way of, of approaching traditional questions in archaeology, but by doing things practically. So, so, you know, traditionally we would look at, for example, a stone tool or a bronze axe. And academically we could, we could measure it, we could get its dimensions, its weight, we could categorize it with a typology into certain styles but actually it tells you very little if, if anything about how it was used and what it was used for. So experimental archaeology is a way of taking those traditional questions and applying practical reconstructive experiments to them to try and answer more questions um, and in more detail. Um, and so really, in terms of the History Festival, we've been trying to sort of really get down on tight focus on some of our activities to really see how things were done, the processes behind them, and of course, the important thing is what that says about the people that lived long ago, um, and that's, that's critical. Yeah, I remember one of the things that really stuck in my mind was when we had a just very, very detailed description of the tool that was devised to extract the arrowhead from the cheek of the young Prince Harry, later Henry V. And we then inserted um, an arrowhead into the carcass of a, of a deer and built our own version of this extracting tool and went, OK, well, let's see whether it works. And lo and behold, it did. Yeah, and, and that's a really good example of, of how far you can take it. So it, it combines lots of disciplines. So we had a fantastic blacksmith, Ian, who, who recreated this artefact from, from the original sketches of the, of the guy that designed it. Um, but then, of course, you know, you can recreate it as an artefact and pass it around and give it to people. And they say, wow, that's interesting. But until you actually try and extract an arrowhead stuck in bone, for example, from an actual carcass, do you begin to understand the issues behind it and how far you have to screw the thread into the socket, uh, what the, the lever action actually does and how, how difficult it is to grip. And then, of course, you consider doing that on a human face of a future king. And it really starts to bring home the, the realities of that situation. And, and the public, not just the public, but we find it fascinating uh, because it is. Yeah, absolutely. But presumably you as, a, as an archaeologist, I mean, you started your, your career as an archaeologist doing what everyone else does as sort of field work, but also kind of studying and reading the texts and, yeah. you know, learning, reading your books and so on. At what point did you start to kind of sort of think, mm, OK, living history, um, um, this sort of this type of uh, experimental archaeology has got a kind of value? Where, where, what was that kind of sort of Damascene moment for you? Um, for me, I, I was originally, I trained in, in early Stone Age archaeology, so, so my, my original interests were a million and a half years ago and beyond right. in, in Africa, so, so this is all very recent. Um, but uh, actually, it, it came down to stone tools, and I have one in my pocket. Ah. Um, and in my pocket, I have something that in archaeological terms is called a, a, a hand axe. It's made from flint in this case, but you find them all over the old world for a yep. period of over a million years. These things crop up for a million years. And as an early Stone Age archaeologist, people were saying, this is 30 years ago to be fair, but people were saying that this represents a stasis in technology for a million years. So those early humans weren't really moving on. They could only make one type of tool and it was pretty basic. It's even called a hand axe. And which implies that you sort of use it in a crude chopping way. And you can still find these illustrations in books, which really annoy me when it shows you using it like this. 
And I became fascinated by this, and I had, I had already sort of started napping flint as, a, as an aside to my studies. And I decided to, to run an experiment to actually see what it took to create these tools. And on the face of it, it's, it's a piece of stone that's been flaked with another stone and, and a piece of antler to get the shape. But when you start actually analysing how it's created, you begin to realise that the human, and we're looking at a million and a half years ago when these things start to be made, the human that made this is beginning to think in three dimensions. They're, they're taking right. a lump of rock and they're having to get a three-dimensional piece which has symmetry in three planes from it using just a stone and a piece of antler. And you begin to realise that actually when you, when you recreate these processes and you analyse what's going on in terms of the thought and cognition behind it, this is an incredibly complex and sophisticated thing to produce. This is not a case of picking up a sharp rock and hewing a, a piece of wood or, or a carcass on the, on the savanna. This is actually shaping a piece of stone to get the longest cutting edge possible from a piece of stone. And on the original tools, you'll find that the cutting edge changes around its periphery. So you'll have a razor sharp, one molecule thick. That's 20 times sharper than a surgical scalpel. Wow. One okay. molecule thick tip, and that's to cut the skin of the animal to get the first incision. Right. You'll then have a slightly rougher um, edge for skinning, for separating the skin from the carcass. You don't want it too sharp, because then you cut the skin that you might want to use for other things. And then you might have an even rougher edge for um, breaking bone, for extracting the marrow. Right. So in one simple uh, piece of stone, you have a multi-purpose tool. And over those million years, they do change. You can see the sophistication becomes increased and, and more developed as right. time goes on. So you would never get that information by just looking at it. You have to make it and you have to use it. Right. And that's a really good example of what experimental archaeology can do. Yeah, and how easy is it to kind of to nap a flint? Um, it takes years of practice to make it efficient. Um, and, and again, when you're looking at the archaeological record, you, you'll find millions of these lying all over Africa and all over Europe. Um, and it's difficult to tell whether you're looking at a novice tool, so somebody who's just started making tools for the first time, so it's reasonably crude, or whether you're looking at somebody that's been napping for 30 years. And, and that's where the sort of subtleties and difficulties come in, is, is how you interpret the, the evidence. But what's really clear is that they're not a stasis in technology. They are a continuum, an advancement throughout that million years, going from the first ideas of this to super refined tools half a million right. years ago. Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? Because yeah. you, you're right, you look at it, you just think, okay, that's... The it's a piece of stone, yeah, that's right. But actually, the, the thoughts and the, the cognition behind that is fully modern. And of course, something that we're forgetting about in terms of history in general is aesthetics. So, so you know, we, we have really good evidence of tools that have been made to butcher animals, but then the Napa has done something ridiculously refined to finish it. They've, they've finished it with a, a flake that risks breaking the whole tool. They don't need to do that, but they've done it almost as a, now watch this, this is what I can do. Bang, and you finish this incredible tool which also has an amazing aesthetic sense to it. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. So this is sort of fully, this is sort of modern thinking in, in very early tools. But you know, there's no difference really between that type of artifact and how you can reconstruct it, or a medieval sword and how it actually works in life right. using, using fight books from history. Or, or the recipes that you can recreate using the original food and, and uh, knowledge from history. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that sort of really strikes me is, is you know, you, you go back to the past, let's just go sort of um, to, to the Tudor age or, or before that, you know, and you, you, you know the clothes that they've got, but you don't understand the practical use of those clothes and why they are, the shape they are, the design they are, until you start to wear them. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with linen, you know, the big, long, shirt that you would have had that goes all the way down to your knees that's your kind of undershirt and then you don't you know and and linen is is self-cleaning it keeps the body clean i mean it has these properties that cotton doesn't yeah or silk doesn't and until you actually use it you can't tell can you no i mean another example which which i've been looking at for for 10 15 years or so is is in medieval sword fighting so so you know we, we in the western world we've kind of lost our traditional martial arts and and we now look to the eastern world for their martial arts sort of heritage but the fact is that we had that heritage for millennia 
Um, and the fight books, the books that describe the moves and the way you behave in combat still exist in fragmentary forms. And so years ago, I started looking at detail in those books um, and, and working out how the sword is used in combat and how you can defend yourself and kill somebody in the same instant. And that instinctively led on to costume because it's all very well doing it in a pair of shorts and trainers in a, in a sports hall, but you then very, begin, very rapidly begin to realize that actually they were constrained or helped by the costume they wore. Um, and so I, I then began to sort of create a sword fighting costume from the 1450s and the person I was doing it with went a hundred years earlier, so 1350s, very different styles of costume. Right. And almost immediately I, I began to experience issues. When you're trying to pull off these moves that will kill your opponent really quickly, you realise that you're constrained by fashion. And so the right. points that are holding your hose to your d tight doublet, which is a really fashionable shape to, to sort of accentuate the legs and the, and the chest, actually become an issue when you're trying to be flexible and to kill people on the battlefield. So having encountered these issues, I then looked at things like paintings from the 1450s in the National Gallery and, and elsewhere. And in all of the illustrations where people are fighting in this traditional clothing, they've undone the points which restrict their movements and literally, <laughs> their pants are on show, their buttocks are hanging out, but it means that they can move. Right. And, and so we, we also have to take into account that it's not just functional. History is, is never just functional. We are modern humans. Right. And everything we do... Style and look it, and everything it, is yeah, image. Everything we do has image attached to it and meaning. So, you know, you think about the cars you drive, the clothes we wear, where we go to eat. It all, it all says something about us. We want people to, to understand a certain version of us. And that hasn't changed for thousands of years. Isn't that interesting? So, so and that's the same with your guy in his, in his flint. Absolutely, yeah, that's right. So, so it goes right back into deep time. Um, and that for me is, is the fascinating thing about living history, is trying to get to some of those the sort of meanings behind things. And it's not always just about how well it functions. There's an aesthetic issue going on. There's the, the things you're trying to say about yourself and the culture that you belong to. And that's what I find really interesting. So you've, you've built um, Anglo-Saxon long halls and roundhouses and Roman buildings. And what happens is, is school children come. And what I love about the way you set that up was it's not just good enough to build the building. You've got to live in it. Yeah. It's, they've got to be kind of active places. And um, one of the great tragedies about not having the History Festival this year was that we were due to have properly built and researched Iron Age medieval yeah. buildings where people were going to be living there all week yes. and just doing what they do. Yeah. And I kind of love that idea and it's, and it's a real shame we can't do it. But, but you, you have done that and you've had school children come in. And I think it's wonderful that you can have school children who's age seven or eight learning something that someone who's been sat at their desk for 60 years might never know. Absolutely, and, and this is the key, isn't it? Is, is education for me is, is all encompassing. It, it's not about just children, it's not just about adults, it's about everyone coming together to, to learn these, these amazing things. Um, and the, the, the education style that I've followed for many years is this kinesthetic style. So yes, you can talk about it, you can read about it in books, but until until you've turned a, st a heavy stone quern to grind enough flour to feed you and your 30 compatriots in three hours time, you have no real understanding of the effort and the labor involved. And, and for the many years I've been doing this, it's, it's fascinating to see the, the learning curves and, and the evolution in a very short session. So you can take a child who's never used a quern before to grind, and to start with, the flour will be really rough, the grains will be just be a bit broken and it'll be a bit sort of mealy. And in two hours time, with application of nothing but sweat, they will produce the most fantastically milled flour and huge volumes of it. And in that two hour session, they have learned more about the grinding of flour in the medieval or the Iron Age period than an academic has learnt in 30 years of writing about it. And that for me is, is a fantastic opportunity. And it's also about using the land, isn't it? Because I remember um, turning up once to see you and, and you were kind of experimenting with, with bramble fibres, see whether you can make a rope out of yeah. it. And actually, I seem to remember that was quite, was quite strong. Good. It was yeah, pretty good. good. Yeah. Uh, and that's another part of living history, isn't it? It's, it's, it's that man is innately kind of pragmatic. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think I think really what we should really say about living history and about experimental archaeology in general is that it, it stands or falls on the questions you ask of it. So right. if, you, if your mission is to turn up in a field and dress as a medieval person, you're never really going to learn much about that field or be able to push the knowledge forward. You have to, before you start, and it's really important, you have to say, why am I standing in this field dressed as a medieval person? You have to come up with really clear questions and you set about trying to answer them. Um, and I think, again, going back to the, the start of this conversation, I think the, the discipline has been guilty of not doing that for many years. And, and if we want to push living history forward, we should all stand in that field doing real things with meaning behind them, with a purpose. And only by doing that will we begin to really get to the, the sort of underlying knowledge that we're after. Yeah, I think the other thing is, is, is for me, experimental archaeology, living history, whatever you want to call it, you know, when it is done well and when it's done with rigour, it's so valuable. I mean, the, the, you know, the, there is no place for sneering about this. You know, it, it, it shouldn't be that, you know, I want to come to the History Festival just to see a lecture. I want to see because I want to learn and find out fascinating things about the past. And, Absolutely, and the living yeah. history and the living history we put on is a, a, a really good example of that. Yeah, and I mean, there's, there's, this is where we've been trying to take it, isn't it, in the last yeah. few years, is, is to blend those two things. They're, they're not separates. There, there shouldn't be a sort of academic, sort of formal paper-giving side and a, and a living history side. They, they should seamlessly blend yep. because each of them contribute to each other. And if you honestly think that, that you can only go down the academic route or only go down the experimental route, you're, you're living in the wrong world because actually they, they contribute to each other in terms of knowledge. And by combining the two, you get a much better result. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and all this, the work that you and I have been doing over the last sort of three years of the History Festival has been leading towards that and, you know, <laughs> should have been this year. Yeah. But, but you know, it is, it is you know, we, we've been getting experts in. So I think it's also, you know, it's been fascinating that we've done a whole lot of medical work yeah. and, and surgery, and we've had a living historian, um, someone who really knows their stuff about that particular period, but we've also brought in like a veterinary surgeon yeah. who knows about modern yeah. medicine yeah. and modern surgery and applying what they know to what was known about the past. And, and it's just been fascinating, hasn't it? Yeah, and it's been really interesting to see to see both of those people learn on the spot, isn't it? So when yeah. they're actually performing the experiment on the carcass, uh, then the, the, the veterinary surgeon is telling us what he would do in the modern world. Right. The, the historian is telling us what, what would have happened in the ancient world. And sometimes you get these crossovers and these sudden sort of moments of, of uh, realization that, that there are links through that, that sort of period of time that, that, that were unseen before. Right. And it's a really sort of dynamic dynamic learning experience for both parties and of course the audience that are right there watching it all happen with a few oohs and ahs of yes, course. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a really great opportunity to expand knowledge. Yeah and I think it's really important to kind of underline that, that the living history that we have here at the History Festival is, is not people just dressing up. No. It really isn't. It's, it's about furthering our understanding and knowledge of the past. Yeah. By doing things. Yeah. <laughs> learning from the process of doing. Absolutely. Oh, good morning. Uh, my name's Paul Bavel. Um, this over here is my uh, good colleague, Kyle Glover. We're the Foreign Field Living History Group on our uh, second year here at Chalk Valley History Festival. So we're here to present uh, the Wars of the Roses uh, to the schools. Um, what you can see here, we've got the weapon racks. We're going through the evolution of armour. So starting with the simple padded jack that you've got hanging on the side there. Through where you can see here, Kyle is uh, demonstrating the male armour um, that is over the flexible placing plus the plate and how these armours come about. Uh, is what we're looking to do. And then moving on from the armour is into the variety of weapons. Uh, across the Wars of the Roses period, it is one of many English civil wars before the English Civil War actually starts. Uh, it's a large, protracted fight between the royal family, uh, to be perfectly honest, uh, fought out by the yeomanry, the peasantry, the middle classes and the noble classes of England, uh, and demonstrating a lot of the weapons that we'll be using here. So how you use the sword how you use the maces, what are their advantages, what are their disadvantages. Um, we've got uh, a number of schools coming to visit us during the day. We've seemed to be about quite popular this year. I think we've got five. So mace, yes, always, always a favourite, this one, isn't it? A good old bashing, happening, un uncivilised weapon for a more darker age. Uh, we're very, very good for smashing into and through armour. 
I mean, that of course is going to make, it might not go through the armor, but it will make a similar looking dent on the other side of it that's going to hurt. Very good for caving in skulls. If you're galloping past somebody on horseback, the sheer weight of it, bring that down on the infantryman's head as you go past and it will swing itself as it goes. A repeated weapon. It really is an ugly weapon, but it really is an ugly age. So in the previous Chalk Valleys, I've been looking at different aspects of the history of blacksmithing. And this year we were going to be doing World War II engineering. The reason that I'm not using the term World War II blacksmithing is because at the end of the First World War, motor mechanics had advanced to such a stage that the horse and cart was obsolete. There was no need for it anymore. Everyone was moving on to cars, moving into vans and lorries. And so there was a huge surge of blacksmiths just putting down their hammers, walking away from their forges and turning them into mechanical workshops, which is why as you travel the length and breadth of the country, you will see a lot of mechanics for, um, called the old forge. In World War I, as you were traveling around, you would often see row upon row of blacksmiths doing various tool, um, tasks, um, heating, bending bits of equipment, re-straightening them, what have you, and also the main thing with World War I was the tanks themselves, fixing them, uh, making sure they were back up and running. And this was, it was not an easy job, but it was manageable. In World War I, the tank armour was approximately this thick, so between quarter and half an inch thick. And so if it was bent and needed fixing, then someone could, in theory, go in with a large enough hammer and hit it back into shape. The tanks bodies themselves were also riveted together and so it was just a case of taking out the old rivets and replacing them. By World War II it was a very, very different story and the tank armour was a lot thicker. And so the chalk line we see here was from the front end of a Churchill tank and the overall thickness of this piece of bar was the front end of a Tiger II tank. And so a completely different story, you could not just tap it back into shape. And so the tools had to change and the armies had to change as a result. And so gone were the rows of blacksmiths and instead they were replaced by fields of engineers of mechanics using tools such as oxyacetylene torches, mobile welding units that could just roll up, be pulled out, fired up, weld the new plates in, take the old plates away and off they went to the next battlefield. And so that's what we're going to be demonstrating today. The other thing that we're going to be looking at as well, and especially making in this instance, are the field modifications. The most famous field modification from World War II was the Cullen Hedgerow Cutter, a huge battering ram fixed onto the front of the tanks so that they could just drive through the hedgerows without being lifted up and being made vulnerable to the incoming anti-tank fire. And the other, um, the other field modification, which is what we will be making, was the wire cutter. Now, for any of you who have seen the cinematic masterpiece that is Force 10 from Navarone, will know what we are talking about. The Germans would lay very thin garroting wire between the trees across the roads, and as the vehicles were moving at great speed, the wire would just slice through any flesh that was in its way. And so this was a very swift and very effective way of being able to wipe out generals, captains, commanders. And so they had to come up with, with a, a solution. And that's what we'll be making, made from scrap metal that we've taken from the local forge. And we will get started now.
And there we have it, one uh, World War II Willie's Jimmy Jeep wire cutter. So what I'm wearing is sort of a lower class uh, Tudor um, outfit, so around 1590s to 1600s mostly. Um, at this time it's a two-piece outfit, so you've got a bodice and your skirts, um, which you can see underneath. I've curtailed my uh, top skirt up, so this is what you would have done in hot weather if you were working outside. So traditionally at the moment I'm, I look like I'm working outside. I've got the straw hat on, I've got my um, expensive dress or um, hotter dress or skirt um, curtled up and then underneath I've got my underskirt as well um, which most of the things you'll see in wheels and things red is a very traditional colour for your petticoat or your underskirt. Um, underneath that I've got very long stockings on which come up above your knee so this is made of a fine wool um, you can get varying degrees you can get heavy wool and also you can also make them out of linen as well. Um, Traditionally, working, um, if you're working in a house or anything, you would have also had a different hat on as well. So this, you'll take that off. So this is known nowadays as a Holbein hat, as you can see it very much in um, your Holbein paintings. But back in the Tudor times, it would have been known as a statute camp. Um, but it's all very comfortable. A lot of people think you are very hot uh, because it's all made of wools and linens. It's like the bodice alone has about eight layers of uh, linen to bake the boning channels and then you've got the wool over the top and the skirt is made out of wool and it's lined with linen and you've got a linen underskirt on. But traditionally this is actually all natural materials so it breathes lovely so unless you're actually hovering over a fire it actually keeps you very nice and cool because you'll sweat into the linens and then that will then keep you cool. Um, and with the bodice and everything a lot of people think that that's very uncomfortable because you're being constricted, but it's actually incredibly comfortable, especially if it's made for you, because it just fits your body type. As you warm up, or as the bones warm up, this also sort of moulds to your body, so it, it's incredibly comfortable, to be honest. I like wearing it. Um, and yeah, and you would have had things like your apron and uh, your linen um, undershirt. A lot of people think that the Tudor times, um, they didn't wash, which again is a, a bit of a myth. They would have washed their linen undergarments very often, probably twice a week. And it's just the, uh, the top one, so your bodice and your skirts, you wouldn't have really washed that often unless they got very muddy. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our Living History special. And I've got to say that it's something that I feel really strongly about. You know, these guys that we have here, they're not just people dressing up. There is a real historic rigor to what we do here. Uh, and actually it really does cast a very fresh and exciting and interesting light on the past that we don't always get from just people standing up on stage and talking. So, you know, it's part of the many facets that we have here at the Chalk Valley History Festival. Well, tomorrow we enter the weekend and of course, had it been the real History Festival, there'd been absolutely tons going on, but there's still tons going on on the Chalk Valley History Show too. We've got Karen Mandeback, we've got Tom Holland, we've got Al Murray, and much, much more beside. So thank you for watching and see you tomorrow. <laughs>